Welcome. My name is Reed Moon. I'm the owner of Moon's Rare Books in Provo, Utah, and I've been asked by Corey Andrews of the Hi-Fi Live team to uh, give this lecture. So for the next 15 minutes or so, I would like to do a presentation called From Reformation to Restoration. Uh, the, and here it goes. So back in 1834, um, Joseph Smith was visiting some of the members in Pontiac, Michigan, which is just outside of Detroit. Now this is about 200 miles from Kirtland and he's visiting the Stevenson family and a group of saints is gathered together and the prophet Joseph is given a lecture, a sermon, and when he's done, it's time for him to go. Sister Stevenson says, Brother Joseph, would you take this bushel of apples back to your wife Emma? And he goes, absolutely. Can I ask one more favor? And she said, sure, what would you like? And he goes, I saw a book on your shelf. Could I borrow that book? And they said, which one? And he went over and he picked up a book that looked just like this. And he said, I would like to borrow this book and I know you'll be in Kirtland within the next year and I'll return it then. And they said, sure. And so the prophet Joseph Smith took this book and on his way back to Kirtland, he began to read a story. Um, an account, and one account that he read uh, happened in Coventry, England in 1515. The whole town gathered together, and it was normally market day, but nobody brought anything to sell. But as soon as the town square filled up, a man in a black robe walked out and said, the trial will now begin. And let's call the first witness. And the first witness was a little girl, just six years old. And she came up front, and then the judge asked her, tell us what your parents have been teaching you at home. And she nervously looked over at her parents, and they nodded, and then she began to say the following. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the judge said, that's enough. And they called the next witness, a little boy, and that little boy got up and the judge says, tell us what you've learned. And he began to say the following, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. And he recited the 10 commandments. And two other children were called up and they recounted similar passages from the Bible. And then the judge said, we have all the evidence we need. These parents are teaching their children the Bible in English and that was illegal 500 years ago in England. And the judge said, we have to make an example of these parents, and so, and the punishment is death. And those parents were burned at the stake for teaching their children the Bible in English. Now think about that. Is that the time for Joseph Smith to be born? Of course not. Because there wasn't even a Bible to be read. And the only Bible to be read was in Latin, and Joseph, with his third grade education, couldn't read the Latin. Well, this, about this same time, a young man who was 12 years old went to Oxford University. And he decided he wanted to make it his life's mission to translate the Bible into English. And to do that, he needed to learn languages. And over six years, he learned Hebrew, Greek, Latin, German, French, Italian, and English. And he began that project. And by 1525, he had done the New Testament. He had some copies printed abroad and brought into England, but they were quickly gathered up and destroyed. And eventually he's betrayed by a friend and he's imprisoned. And while he's imprisoned, he's asked and he's challenged, how dare you translate the Bible into English? And when he is presented with this, that young man prophesied of Joseph Smith when he said the following. He said, if I'm permitted to live and finish this translation, ere many years hence, I will cause a boy who drives the plow will know more of the scriptures than thou dost. That young man was William Tyndale. And he gave his life to do the translation. He was put to death in October of 1536. But before he's put to death, his last words were, Lord God, please open the eyes of the King of England. Well, three years later, the King's heart, who was Henry VIII, was softened somewhat, 
and he did the first authorized translation of the Bible. And those appeared in churches, but you would have noticed something different because those Bibles were chained to the pulpit. You still couldn't have the Bible in your own home, but at least you could hear it in your own language. Now, Henry VIII died a few years later and his daughter came into power and she did not like some of the changes her father had made. And she wanted to return England to its original religion and she began making it very hard on the Protestants who were living there. And so great was the persecution of Mary, Queen Mary, uh, that now 450 years later we know her as Bloody Mary. Well, these Protestants fled to Geneva, Switzerland because there was freedom of religion there and they desperately wanted the Bible to be in their own tongue. And so they got together, they acquired some old manuscripts and they translated the Bible into English. And it's known as the Geneva Bible. And I have a copy. In fact, this copy was printed in 1599. It was first printed in 1560. But this became the first study Bible. This is the first Bible that the common person could own. And as I look through it, I see things that really you won't find in your modern Bible. In fact, that is a font with 12 oxen. And up at the top, it says, for the temple. That was supposed to be in the temple. 500 years ago, they knew that that was supposed to be in the temple. Now, this is the first study Bible. And if I go back to the New Testament, to Hebrews, where it talks about the priesthood, right here it says Melchizedek priesthood. And in these notes at the bottom, it says there is also a, I know that's hard to see, it's very small, Levitical priesthood. So before there's a King James Bible, there's this version of the Bible. Now, this is the version brought to the Americas by the Pilgrim. This is actually the version quoted and alluded to and read by Shakespeare over a thousand times in his plays. But this was a very important version of the Bible. But they stopped printing this in the mid-1600s. Now, we use the King James Bible it will not be until 1611 that the King James Bible is printed. And very few copies have survived, but I do have a copy here. That is a first edition King James Bible. Now, it, it looks like it's handwritten, but it is actually printed on a printing press. And... This was very influential on the English language and in religion in general. And for 270 years, this Bible went unchallenged. And when Joseph Smith was deciding which version to use, it, the Protestants used the King James. And so that's the version that he used. Now, but even 100 years after Tyndale, it's still not the time for Joseph Smith to be born. The pilgrims are fleeing of uh, desperately seeking greater religious liberty and they go to the Americas. But the time's still not right. If Joseph Smith would have been born in the 1500s, he would have had to have been a William Tyndale type character. If he would have been born in the 1600s, he would have had to have been a William Bradford type Mayflower character. And even the 1700s, we're getting closer, but it's the 1700s, the scriptures say that wise men will be raised up. In fact, if we go back in time to 1776, only one out of three of you would have been for independence and one out of three very loyal to England and a third on the fence. But along came a guy who had a gift of writing and he wrote a little pamphlet that got people off the fence and I have a copy of that today. This is a copy of Thomas Paine's Common Sense printed in Philadelphia in 1776 and this got people off the fence. And George Washington credits this in part for there being a Declaration of Independence just six months after this is printed. Now, in 1776, Joseph Smith's mother is just a babe, baby of one years of age. And his father had, was a three-year-old baby. 20 plus years later, 
Joseph Smith Sr. and Lucy Max Smith are married and they begin having children, but now the stage is set. Where they are living is ripe for the restoration. But before the restoration, there had to be a reformation and that took 300 years. But now the time was right. And we're in the year 2020. 200 years ago was the first vision of Joseph Smith. Now, it would be 20 years after Joseph Smith had that vision before it would be printed. And that came about as follows. In December of 1839, Joseph Smith met up with Orson Pratt in Philadelphia and they spent a few weeks together. And just months before that, Joseph Smith had began writing his personal history and had decided to include his um, account of the first vision. And he told this to Orson Pratt in detail. And Orson Pratt soon thereafter printed uh, a tract, a pamphlet called Remarkable Visions. And in this tract, I've read it, it gives a very detailed account of the first vision and I really like the detail after the part where Joseph Smith gets to the grove and he begins praying he said he looked up and he saw a light and he describes it almost like a, a bright star but it gradually got closer and closer and then he said when it got closer it lit up the whole countryside but as it got near the tops of the trees, this young 14-year-old boy was afraid that the leaves would be consumed in fire. And when the light reached the tops of the trees, he realized that they weren't consumed. And then he said that this gave that 14-year-old boy confidence that he would be able to endure the presence. And then we know in his own words um, that that was the father and the son. Now, Remarkable Visions was printed in 1840. Joseph Smith uh, and the Wentworth letter telling that story was printed in 1842. Now, it was during this time that Joseph received a lot of support from his family while he's going through the process of being trained by the angel Moroni, and then he gets the plates, and then uh, he's also married, and then by 1829, he's right in the middle of translating the Book of Mormon. His younger brother, Samuel, is the first one to accept the message, and he's baptized in May of 1829. And so I think it's very appropriate that that young man, Samuel Smith, became the first missionary a year later. Now we know that, and actually we just barely passed the 190th anniversary on March 26th, the 190th anniversary of the printing of the Book of Mormon when it came off the E.B. Grand and Press, and then we know that about 11 days later was the restoration of the church. Now I have here, this is a first edition copy of the Book of Mormon, printed in 1830. And it was Joseph Smith who told his younger brother, Samuel, I want you to take this book and go share it, share the messages in this book. Now there's no missionary training center or anything, so that young Samuel Smith loaded up his knapsack full of copies of this book and went out trying to share the message. And on that first day, he walked over 25 miles and he was rejected by everybody he talked to. And it got late at night and he found an inn and he walked in and told the innkeeper he needed a room and that innkeeper said, young man, what are you doing? Well, Samuel took that as an opportunity to share the gospel and he pulled out a copy of the Book of Mormon and says, sir, I am sharing the message that is in this book that my brother translated from Place of Gold he found buried in the ground. And then the innkeeper's countenance changed and he got irate and he told Samuel, you will not stay here with that book and he physically removed him from his inn. Well, it's late at, late at night, 10 o'clock. What does Samuel do? He walks down the road and he sees an apple tree and decides that's where he will spend the night using his knapsack full of copies of the Book of Mormon as a pillow. Now, that was the first day of the first missionary. Like most missionaries, there were good days and bad days. And a few weeks later, he had a better, he had a better experience. He walked into the Tomlinson Inn, which was on a main road, which was also a stagecoach hub. And he 
saw a man, and people would get a bite to eat while they were waiting for their stage. He saw a man sitting by himself, and he thought to himself, I'll go talk to that man. And so Samuel pulls out a copy of the book and walks over to that man and says, Sir, I have a book you should read. And that man said, Pray tell, what book would that be? And he said, It's the Book of Mormon. Uh, but most people are calling it the Golden Bible. And when he said Golden Bible, that man knew exactly what he was talking about, and he wanted a copy. In fact, he wanted to share it with those who were part of his congregation. Well, Samuel handed him a copy, and the man looked through it and then handed it back, and he says, young man, what's your name? And he says, well, I'm Samuel Smith. And he goes, didn't I see your name in here? And he goes, oh, yes. I'm one of the witnesses. I've seen the gold plates that this was translated from, and my brother translated this book by the gift and power of God. Well, I would like to buy a copy. How much? A dollar twenty-five. And so Samuel sold him a copy, and those men parted ways. Now Samuel went home from the first of what would be six missions, and I'm sure the first question they asked him, Samuel, did you have any baptisms? And they, the, he said, no, I didn't. But here's what he didn't know. That man took this, uh, a copy of the first edition home, and he read it. Now, the Book of Mormon is 588 pages, and it takes about 25 hours to read the book, cover to cover, without stopping. So that meant that man would have spent three to four hours a day reading the book. And when he finished, he told his wife, he goes, I'm not finding anything that contradicts the Bible. And she encouraged him, read it again. And he read it a second time in two weeks. And when he was done, he said, I believe it's true. And so did she. And they then they shared it with the family, including his younger brother named Brigham. That is how Brigham Young got the Book of Mormon, from his older brother, Phineas Young, who met Samuel Smith in the Tomlinson Inn. And then Brigham Young had a good friend named Heber, and Heber C. Kimball accepted the gospel. And so Samuel Smith, the first missionary, was responsible for bringing two of the most stalwart apostles and the future prophet of the church. Now, the Book of Mormon, I've always loved the touch and feel of these, and I'm always curious about the history of each book. And I wish there was some type of GPS tracker that we could put in and then just plug it in and see where, what had happened. But fortunately, because of the writing and everything in this book, we do know some of the history of this book. In fact, we know everywhere it's been. And if this book could talk, it would say, I spent a night under an apple tree. This is Samuel Smith's first edition copy of the Book of Mormon. There have been two million missionaries go out, but this is the first missionary's copy of the Book of Mormon. And it is absolutely one of my favorite treasures. And I am probably one of the luckiest people around. Every day I get to track down treasures. And I love history, especially early church history. I'm looking forward to conference this weekend. And in all of my travels and all that I've done, it's only strengthened my testimony that the Book of Mormon is true. Joseph Smith is the prophet of the restoration. And I want to leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. But before I go, I want to encourage all of you to go to High Five Live, like the page, and if you would like to see more of these lectures, be sure and do that, and I hope to see you again in the future.